It's time now for some political analysis with our panel. Mark Landler covers the White House for the New York Times. Leslie Sanchez is a CBS News political contributor. Sungmin Kim covers the White House from Capitol Hill for the Washington Post. And Paula Reed is a CBS News correspondent. Great to have you all here. Always a lot to chew on, but Paula, this, <laughs> this should be, we should have our own legal panel here because I feel like there's so much to digest from this week. Let's start with the president's tweets this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, he is out there defending his son and saying that he has no concerns about him legally and this meeting that he took at Trump Tower with uh, a lawyer linked to the Kremlin. Should he be concerned? Yes, he should be concerned, even more so than he should be concerned for himself, because Donald Trump Jr. does have some legal exposure here. And the fact that he has not yet been interviewed by special counsel investigators, that should concern everyone, because typically in an investigation like this, you want to come in early. You want to be someone they're gathering evidence for, uh, from rather, not the person who walks into the room and they have a pile of evidence and they start going through it. Now, his potential legal exposure, the first is for, for anyone who walks into the situation, lying. But in a case like this, where there are all these different iterations of what happened in that Trump Tower meeting, that's a, a tremendous exposure for him. The possibility of perjury. He says he did not know. His father did not know about the Trump Tower meeting. Michael Cohen said he did. I think, legally speaking, it would be easy to discredit Cohen as a witness. And if uh, Mueller thought there was something there, he likely would have handed that case off. But then the big question of the entire case is, was there any coordination or support or assistance with the Russians in term of, terms of disseminating that dirt that they had? Now, at the time, the first version of events given by the White House was that this was a meeting about adoptions linking to uh, an issue of concern for the Russian government. The president today says, no, it was about opposition research solely, and there's nothing illegal about that. Exactly. The good news for them is there's no crime in lying to the press. Uh, but what they need to do is they need to figure out what exactly their story is, and it needs to be supported by the evidence. They need to make sure there's no witnesses or other evidence that would contradict that and expose them to lying when they sit down with investigators. But the special counsel does have questions uh, for the president about why that statement was drafted, sort of misleading people about the reason for this, this meeting. Mark, when we had Kellyanne Conway on the show, she was trying to explain that the president, when he uses this term Russian hoax, is referring to misunderstandings or misconstruing of facts related to the investigation and that it has nothing to do with what his national security team says. You've been writing about the fact that they're saying two different things about the same topic, actually, which is the view on Russia, period. Yeah, this is a, a, a recurring theme with the Trump White House, which is the efforts of, of his aides to sort of narrow the, the scope of what he's saying. When he talks about a Russian hoax, particularly in a tweet or in some of the inflammatory ways he does, he's really denigrating the entire effort to get at Russian interference in American elections and, frankly, to guard against interference in the midterm elections. And so I think that this week we saw this just amazing split screen where the administration arrayed all its top uh, intelligence and law enforcement officials behind the podium at the White House made this persuasive presentation about how seriously they take the threat and what they're going to do to try to fend it off. And then a day later, hours later, at a political rally, President Trump, in effect, dismisses the whole thing as much ado about nothing. For Kellyanne Conway to say, well, he's only narrowly talking about an investigation, no one in the American public is taking it that way. They're viewing it as what I think the president intends, which is to diminish the importance of the issue. And I think the reason he does that goes back to his own long long-standing uh, doubts about the legitimacy of his own election and his concern that if he gives this any credibility, it will reduce his own credibility. And so I think that this split screen is really what matters and not the after-the-fact attempts by the White House to spin it. Is the effort here to manage pu the public understanding of the Russian investigation, or is it to manage the president's own party? Because what you hear consistently from the Republican establishment is that they stand with the intelligence community and their version of events, not the characterization a as a hoax. I think it's a little bit of, it's, it's multiple things. I think in terms of the public perception of Russia and also with, we talk about how, along with the Mueller investigation, we talk often about how the president's constant tweeting and his attacks on Mueller is partially to just publicly discredit the investigation. So you do see that kind of. With an eye towards what could happen 
Exactly. With a potential it, impeachment. Exactly. And you saw the shock coming from Capitol Hill right after his comments in Helsinki alongside Vladimir Putin. But I think that whenever we ask congressional Republicans, you know, look at the president's rhetoric. A lot of times they do point towards, well, look at what Dan Coats is saying or what Secretary Nielsen is saying or Director Ray. They're satisfied with what uh, what the, his administration officials are saying. But, you know, that is a different message coming from his top officials versus the president. Leslie, I know you've been out there doing some reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, does all of this translate to people at home um, uh, and, and people who are going to go place votes in November? Big disconnect, right. So what the Republican Party is thinking is they want to buck traditional norms. They want the president not to have the major losses that most president would have at a midterm election when these midterms tend to be a referendum on the president. They're saying, wait a minute, we have raised $250 million this election cycle. We have $50 million in the bank, meeting the Republican Party, and they're ready to to marshal those resources on the ground and they understand what the president understands which is very much to this point the pulse of the people what used to be a roar in the Republican Party is now a whisper because the economy is strong the president is now at 50 percent approval more or less Congress is still at 10 percent approval and they see that unemployment's low and they can win they may like the agenda they may not like the man Paula just to button up one part of the legal question this week, and that was uh, <laughs> so the, many. <laughs> the former Trump campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, mm -hmm. was in court last week. He, he will be headed back there. There was all this color about his personal wealth, his clothing. Um, <laughs> what is the prosecution trying to lay out here in terms of the picture? Well, as the judge likes to continue to remind everyone, he is not on trial for having a lot of money and throwing it around. This trial has nothing to do with the president, has nothing to do with the campaign. The allegation is that he made tens of millions of dollars from lobbying on behalf of Ukrainian politicians, but instead of having the check sent to one of his six houses, he had it put into offshore bank accounts. And then in order to allegedly get this money into the U.S., he laundered it through these luxury purchases. And that's where we get some of the color. The homes, the cars, the ostrich coat. Yes. Uh, and so that's their thing theory of the case. But it is important to remember we did hear from some of their uh, his accountants uh, late in the week and there was evidence that some of this conduct, especially doctoring forms uh, when he wanted to try to get some loans, some of that conduct did extend to his time uh, in the Trump campaign. Is there any connection to the president and what has happened so far? So far, no connection to the president. Uh, Kellyanne Conway, she cited the judge. But let's be really clear what the judge has said um, about the special counsel investigation. During the, the preliminary hearings, the judge had questions about whether or not tax evasion or bank fraud, whether or not that was in the special counsel's authority. The judge came out and said, you're not interested in bank fraud. You're just trying to get this guy to cooperate in your investigation. Everyone sort of nodded and acknowledged this was a fact, and he allowed the case to proceed. But the president and his allies, they've seized on those comments to try to say the special counsel investigation is illegitimate or a federal judge said they were out of bounds. But the judge has sort of nodded to exactly what's going on here. Mark, do we have any idea, turning to the foreign policy front, what was in the letter from President Trump to Kim Jong-un that was handed off this weekend to North Korean officials? We don't know the specifics of what's in that letter, but I think we have a fairly good idea, based on the president's own characterization of his recent interaction, that it was probably a very friendly letter thanking Kim for the letter he had sent uh, and probably setting the predicate for another meeting. There's a lot of talk about maybe doing it <clears throat> Pardon me, at the United Nations in September. Um, but again, to go to this, it's a recurring theme with this administration, this notion of a dissonance or a split screen. You have this very cozy, friendly relationship uh, being built between Kim and Trump. And then underneath, you have this very combative, even sometimes bitter negotiation between Mike Pompeo and his counterpart on the issue of denuclearization. Uh, and you saw that in stark terms, even as um, an American diplomat was handing the letter to the North Koreans in Singapore to deliver to Kim, Another North Korean official was lambasting the United States and Mike Pompeo uh, for their bad attitude in the negotiations. And so what you see, and, and I think it's deliberate on the part of the North Koreans, is an effort in a way to drive a wedge between the president and his own negotiators. Kim thinks that President Trump uh, is sincere and well-meaning and well-intentioned and wants to have a good relationship, but those pesky diplomats keep <laughs> demanding that North Korea do all these things to denuclearize. <laughs> it's a pretty effective strategy. It puts Mike Pompeo in a very bad spot because he's the guy uh, who has to deliver this deal. Um, and he's been very forthright about saying he sees a long, difficult negotiation ahead of the United States and North Korea.
And he acknowledged, he said, the timeline is going to be up to Chairman Kim. Thus far, no denuclearization that we have seen at the moment. We're going to take a quick break here. We have so much more to talk about, so stay with us. <laughs> We are back now with our panel. Uh, Sungmin Kim, I want to ask you, uh, the president has already been out there on the campaign trail three times this week. He was in Ohio last night ahead of the special election. We also learned that former President Obama is going to be hitting the campaign trail pretty soon and laid out his endorsements. Is, are they going to be going head to head? It'd be interesting to see what that, if that happens and where there can be the most influential. I think one test case of that could be in the Georgia governor's race where we've seen uh, Stacey Abrams as one of the 80 candidates that the former president put his muscle behind when he made his announcement or endorsement announcements over the week. Uh, but the president, uh, President Trump, has also put his political power behind the Republican candidate there. Remember in that primary, it looked as if the more uh, the, per the perceived more mainstream candidate, Casey Cagle, would have won the primary, but President Trump weighed in with a tweet and boom, went to Brian Kemp and winning that nomination. So that could be an interesting state considering all the dynamics in Georgia where the two presidents could go head to head. But uh, the president's uh, political power and how much he matters is really going to be on display in that special election this Tuesday. I mean, we mm -hmm. saw him go last minute, try to get that last minute surge for Republican Troy Balderson, uh, you know, ahead of the election on Tuesday, but people are, are already drawing parallels to that special election that we had in Pennsylvania um, back in March, where it's a very Republican district. Uh, the president had won that district by 20 points, but it was the Democrat who uh, surged to victory in that race. Uh, there's already a lot of nervousness among the Republican Party about whether they're going to lose the seat. This is a seat that went for President Trump by 11 points. This is a seat that the Republicans should win, but outside groups are pouring so much money into this race. Um, and it'll be a major uh, backlash for Republicans if uh, Democrats emerge victorious there on Tuesday. Leslie, do you expect the seat well, to be know, flipped? Uh, I don't. I, I don't. Um, it, it, a lot of people would like to think that that's the case, but I think there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of undercurrent underneath this wave. We say this the big blue wave with a lot of pink boats, the female candidates, the non-traditional <laughs> candidates that are coming in. We like. But I, I, in this case, when the president does, in most cases, marshal his resources, get the party behind and put all those dollars in, that was really the message of the summer meeting in Austin last week, that you get on board or you get out. This president is going to win. You need to get his message and really champion that. But I think there's some He anomalies. made that clear in Ohio last night, He right? really did. They, and he still, and, the, and the word is coming down, which is why I say the, the Republican Party went from a roar to a whisper. They're like, well, he's winning. So at what cost do they win? But there's interesting issues like that. And I'd also point to a non-traditional place like uh, Texas uh, Congressional District 31, which you have MJ Hager, which is the female candidate the, the, the uh, veteran um, uh, helicopter pilot who's running, who's raising tr four times as much as her incumbent opponent, Republican era. She used to be a Republican, running as a Democrat, getting a lot of interest, and Republican women are taking her seriously and now looking at holding fundraisers for her. So there's a lot of fissures within what these swing districts or even Republican safe districts would look like. And when you listen to the president, when he speaks at these rallies, it sounds like a greatest hit. Some of the things that during his own campaign really mm -hmm. seem to resonate with his base in terms of immigration uh, and the press, Mark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> enemy of the people. Uh, Kellyanne Conway said she doesn't believe that the media is an enemy of the people. This is obviously useful for the president. He cites it frequently. Why does he argue this? Well, as you say, it plays wonderfully with his base, um, and uh, it's been a hit for him throughout the campaign, and it continues to be one of the most popular things. When you go to a Trump rally, uh, it almost has such a feeling of ritual now, and there's certain things that people who go to rallies expect, and one of the things they expect is the opportunity to uh, start chanting CNN sucks and to turn around and, uh, you know, vilify the people standing in the media pen. So that's why he does it. Um, I think that the problem that we're running into uh, is that his repeated and methodical use of the phrase enemy of the people, and he did it as recently as this morning when he also suggested that people in the media cause wars to happen, um, 
is that that phrase is particularly loaded. Um, the phrase fake news, which he also uses, uh, is corrosive to the credibility of the media over time. It's, it's unfair. He shouldn't use it. But the phrase enemy of the people is, I think, a whole different order of magnitude. This is a phrase that has a long historic provenance. It goes back to the French Revolution. It goes back to Stalin, to Mao, to Lenin. Um, people in those totalitarian societies use the phrase enemy of the people to suggest that one group in society was subhuman. And by doing so, it opened the door to all kinds of violence being carried out against them. I'm not saying that President Trump understands the historical uh, provenance of this phrase, but people who are seeing it out in the world certainly do. So by using it over and over again the way he does, I think he opens the door to the possibility of bad things happening. Now, we've been really lucky. We've been through many, many, many rallies during the campaign and since he's been president, and there really hasn't been a spillover to outright violence. It's been more in the realm of menacing reporters, and it's scary, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, I don't think any of us have really uh, had, had anyone take a swing at us. But the, the fear I have is that by continuing to do this, by normalizing this language, by making it part of the vocabulary of the country, he does open the door to have, had to have some violence happen mm -hmm. down the road. And I think that's just extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, and, and that's why I ask it, because I know many of us find it uncomfortable talking about journalists, being them ourselves. Um, Paula, family separation. Uh, tell me where we are with the administration trying to reunify families. They're not completely done with this yet. There's still a long way to go. And I think this is one of the clearest examples of the president sort of coming out with a policy, not all the key players being on the same page. Almost exactly what we saw with the travel ban, too. And we saw, well, yes, it's a deterrent, deterrent. No, it's not a deterrent. No, this is a new policy. No, this isn't a new policy. And they've created quite a legal quagmire for themselves. So there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of reunifying the families. And then the big question of, well, what exactly is the administration's policy at this moment? And if you cross the border to the U.S. illegally? Will you be detained together as a family? Will you be separated? What exactly happens to you? And about roughly 400 or so families. If that may be the last number, yes. All right, thank you very much. We will be right back in a moment. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Until next week, we will be back with you then with a look at race in America one year after Charlottesville. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.